Well, good morning once again. Thanks for clicking on this video and being a part of our online worship experience. If you're new here this morning, my name is Eric Stelzer. I'm the pastor of Neighborhood Church Olathe. We are a new small community of believers and seekers in and around Olathe that desire to see the kingdom of God come in real and tangible ways. As ordinary people like you and me, like live, love, and bless our neighbors in extraordinary ways. And if you live in Olathe or around Olathe and you're looking for a place to belong, a place to experience authentic um, community, if you're looking for a place to have questions answered or just for friendship, man, we'd love for you to consider joining or being a part of our community, especially once COVID 19's um, under control and it's safer for our families. I'll put my contact information in the description below. Feel free to give me a call, shoot me a text, send me an email. I'd love to connect with you and we'd love um, for you to join and be a part of our community. Well, today we're going to continue our sermon series in the book of Acts. And we're going to look at five powerful yet very relevant Bible verses. And I've titled my talk, our sermon, our message today, something I think that's very appropriate. And you're probably going to be like, Wow, creative, Eric, <laughs> right? But it's this phrase that we see um, all across social media. We've seen it on billboards, um, as we're entering stores, we've seen it in commercial, we've seen it everywhere. And it's this, we're in this together. We're in this together. And I can't wait to dive in and show you where I find this in the text. If you're watching this video with some friends or maybe family members, would you share my title with them right now? Because they probably weren't listening. Again, it's we're in this together. We're in this together. And I know some of you are probably watching this alone. I'd love for you to share this on Facebook or on social media and put the hashtag, we're in this together. You don't know, it might be an encouragement to someone else. But we're gonna be looking at Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. Um, so I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Acts 2 right now. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to download the app. You can download the Bible on your phone. Um, I use the U version. It's fantastic. It has a whole bunch of different versions. You can follow along. I'm going to put the text below as well. Um, but as you're downloading the app or maybe open your Bible, let me catch us up to where we are in the book of Luke today. So um, Luke is a doctor and he was a follower of Jesus and he's writing this letter, this book of Acts or the letter of Acts to describe what the early church did, um, the characteristics of the early church after Jesus died and rose again. And just two months prior to the passage that we're in today, we see that Jesus was crucified. He was murdered by merciless men and then three days after that, he rises from the dead and he shows himself, reveals himself, hangs out with a bunch of his disciples. And what he does during that time, he says, I'm going to send my presence. I'm going to send myself, my Holy Spirit, so that you'll be witnesses across this globe. And I want to send you out to share this message of healing and hope for the world. And Peter, in the passage before, Dave's been preaching and he preached on his sermon. In this sermon, he was declaring this message of hope. And what happens is 3,000 people hear the hope, hope-filled hope story of Jesus. They embrace it. And then we come to what they do. And we see this in verse 42. Read with me verse 42. I'm going to read in the English Standard Version. Verse 42, it says, and they, that's the 3,000 that we see in verse 41, they devoted themselves. That's, they continually committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship or the community to breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. They were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. It's not socialism. It's not communism. These are spirit-filled people that were compelled by the love of Jesus to be like, man, I see a brother in need. I see someone in my new community who doesn't get to eat, or who has this need, and they're selling their possessions. That's like their homes or their property, and they're selling their belongings, other things, in order to meet needs of others. Verse 46, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together 
and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved or those who were embracing this message of hope. Hey, let me pray for us. Father God, I um, pray that in these moments that we get to share together, that your presence would be real and powerful. God, we don't need another sermon or a talk. And God, we need to experience your presence. We need you to transform us from the inside out. And God, I pray that you will use this message in a powerful way for all those who are listening and wherever they are. God, I pray that this would impact them and they would leave here experiencing your presence, loving Jesus more, and loving their neighbors and their communities all the more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the past couple of weeks, past couple of months have been insanely tumultuous, have they not? We just look across the landscape of our world. There's a, a virus that is impacting every corner of the globe and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, more than that, of lives are being taken by this virus. We have friends and family members in our community who are experiencing loss because of this virus. It's running rampant. We have livelihoods that people have been, cre or we have livelihoods that people have been working on their whole entire lifetime for generations and generations that are being taken from them in a matter of weeks. Domestic violence, domestic abuse is on the rise by experts would say, some experts would say by 20%. Husbands, boyfriends, violently beating their wives and their children and their kids. Hatred filling homes, evilness. We have racial injustice and inequality covering the headlines of our newspapers, abuse of power, riots in the streets. It's a crazy time that we live in right now. And this is, this is only what we're actually like seeing in the newspapers. Like right now in this moment, there is a high probability as you're watching this that there are women being transported in trucks across Highway 70 through Kansas City, east and west, to be sold into slavery, to be sold for prostitution. All across the world, there are kids that are forced to work without pay, child labor. We have whole villages ravaged and plundered and set on fire. Genocide happening in our world today. It's crazy. And all it's doing is creating more and more fear and uncertainty. And we can feel it each and every one of us. Hopelessness seems to be the word of the day, right? Many of us saying like, is there ever going to be a time of peace? Is there ever going to be relief? Is there ever going to be hope? You know, in our passage today in Acts 2, on the first century, these people experience the same things that we're experiencing now. Racism bigotry, social injustice, abuse of power, child labor, prostitution, evil and wickedness running rampant in the day of the Bible as well. And when you actually look back through history, you see that this is, 
This is common to mankind. There's evil and wickedness and all this hurt and pain. And the question that you and I ask, the question humanity has been asking is, is there hope? Is there hope? Is there hope in this world that seems so hopeless? And friends, this is why Jesus came. Because what we're experiencing right now, what we're or being a part, or, or yeah, what we're experiencing right now is not the way of Jesus. It's not what he intended for the world. It's not what he intended for this creation for human beings. Like what we're experiencing now and what humanity's experienced, what the first century is, has experienced, it's, it's not what Jesus intended and it's no way in what Jesus wants for this world. And in our passage today, we see these people embracing this hope that Jesus gives. And we see their lives are radically transformed. But before we get into like how their lives are transformed or how they interacted with society, like we have to understand why. What was this message of hope that they received? Like until we understand that. Until we understand what Jesus wants for our communities, for our neighborhoods, for our cities, like we're never going to be able to put a stop to social injustice. We're never going to be able to bring hope for the hurting. And so we have to understand what motivated and moved these people because we see later on that these same people, the Bible says they were turning the world upside down. Societies were being transformed and changed because of this message of hope, the good news of Jesus. And so the question is like, what is that? What is, the, what is this message of hope? And normally I save this for the end, but like, man, we got to get this before we can even jump into Acts 2.42 and understand how we ought to live our lives in this crazy season. And so it all starts back in Genesis. And I, and I may put some Bible verses below. But the thing is, God created the world. We see he created the world for humanity to live harmoniously together. With him, in his presence. To worship and praise him. To enjoy peace and harmony. And he tells man, he tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply the earth. So we can fill the world with people that are enjoying community and shalom and peace with one another and enjoying community and shalom and peace with God. And what happens is our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, decide to rebel against God. See, God put them in this beautiful utopia, this garden, and says, this world is for you. Enjoy my presence. Enjoy one another. Enjoy all that I've created. But the only thing is, I don't want you to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happens, if you've been around Christianity at all, or maybe you know a little, you know what happens. Like, Adam and Eve eat of this fruit. They disobey God. They think that their way is more important, is better, is right. And what ends up happening is death, sin, destruction enters into the world. Because God says, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. When you do that, you will die. And so Adam and Eve eat of the tree. And the Bible says, by one man, sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, this disobedience of God, death followed along with him. And so because our great, 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 great grandparents dishonored, disobeyed God, they ruined it all for us. And now sin, death, and destruction have entered into this world. And we're seeing it. We're experiencing it. And humanity's experienced it. But from the beginning, here's the hope. Here's the hope. From the beginning, God says, you know what? I love you and I want to give you restoration. I want to renew this planet. I want to renew and reconcile you and restore this. And so he says, I'm going to send a deliverer. I'm going to send a savior. I'm going to send someone who will bring hope and peace and joy, who will recreate this and reconcile this. 
And that was Jesus. God himself said, I'm going to become man and I am going to walk in the shoes of humanity and I'm going to live a perfect life and die the death that man deserves in order that I might free them from sin, death, destruction. This is the hope-filled story. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death and so we needed someone to take our place to abolish sin and death. And that's what Jesus has done. That's what Jesus did at the end of Luke and Matthew and Mark. And now he's conquered death on the cross. He's risen again to make death and sin and everything evil in the world his footstool. He's conquered it. And now he's making all things new. And this is the message that Peter preached just right before this. And this is the message that these early Jesus followers embraced. They're like, we want to be free. We want to receive the forgiveness of sins. We want to be renewed and restored. We need this hope. And 3,000 of them were like, I embrace that hope. Friends, that's the only hope for our culture. For, that's the only hope for America. That's the only hope for the world. That's the only hope for our communities, our neighborhoods. It's Jesus. He abolishes sin and death. And until we live in line with Jesus, and we can't do that unless we embrace his message, we're not going to see change in the streets. We're not going to see change in our neighborhoods. And that's what these people did. They embraced this message of hope. And we see them later on turning the world upside down. But Luke here gives us a description of what this message of hope did and how it compelled them and how it transformed their lives. Look at verse 42. There's four simple things that it does in the life of someone who embraces hope. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. See, these people, plural, community, they devoted themselves together to the apostles' teaching. They committed themselves, a continual commitment. It wasn't just like, yeah, I agree with that. They're like, no, we're going to spend our time in the apostles' teaching. But the question is, what's the apostles' teaching, right? Because this book was not around for them. There were some letters, there was the Old Testament, but what is the apostles' teaching? It was just the message of Jesus It was the description of what Jesus did and said. And it was like, go and do likewise. So these early Christians devoted themselves to the good news of Jesus. They devoted themselves to the gospel, to this message of hope. It wasn't all about do this and do that and rules. It was about, no, a savior has come to give us freedom, to bring reconciliation, to restore us. And we want to turn from our sins and we want to live the life that he intended for us. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And this is important because when you look at the apostles' teaching, when you look at the Old Testament, when you look at the Bible as a whole, when you look at Jesus' teachings, it's all summed up in two little things. Jesus says this. He says, love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the Garden of Eden, right? Like they were living in community, loving God. And love your neighbor. Love those around you as you'd love yourself. That's that's the whole of this book. And they devoted themselves to that. And this is why they were able to transform societies. And until you and I, until we're able to, to embrace this message of hope and say, man, God is about us loving him and loving those around us in harmony, in peace, in reconciliation. Like we're never going to see change. I mean, we can maybe make some surface level change. But the problem is we don't need more policies like they're good. But we need heart change. We need people to be in love with God and in love with the people around them and realize that people are created in the image of God and they have um, invaluable worth. And that's what these early Christians did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You know, 
just in my own practical life, in my own life, like for Leah and I, like I realize like when I don't spend time um, reminding myself of the good news of Jesus, of reading this, like I get angry. I'm insensitive. I got a wife who's six months pregnant. Like I get impatient. But I tell you, like when I'm in this book, I am so much more gracious and kind and loving and patient with her. And that's what these people did. They devoted themselves to it, but they did it in community. Look at the next phrase, and it says, in the fellowship. That's community. Like they devoted themselves to one another. It wasn't a like, I'm gonna go do my own thing. Every man for himself. Like they devoted themselves to community, to a commonality. And it wasn't just like a social justice thing. Church, it wasn't just a social justice thing. We need to unite on social justice and equality for all men, all women, all children, no matter the race, no matter the gender, we need to do that. But as a community, as believers, we need to be commonly bound by the good news of Jesus, the story of hope that's going to free people. And that's what they did. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Going on in 42, it says, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Some commentators would say like, um, like they devoted themselves to uh, breaking bread as in communion, which a lot of churches do in celebrating. Jesus said when he was at the Last Supper right before he was crucified, he said, hey, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat this, he gave him some bread. He says, do this in remembrance of me. He's, he took a cup of wine. He says, this is my um, blood shed for you. Every time you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And so I'm sure a lot of these Christians probably broke bread together and they reminded themselves of the good news of Jesus, the story of hope, what he did on the cross, the resurrection. So we see Jesus and the gospel and this message of hope are central to what they're devoting themselves to. Like you actually see that later on in 46 when it says, day by day attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts, 47, praising God and having favor with all people. Like they were all about worshiping Jesus, worshiping God together in community, in harmony. And again, this goes back to the Garden of Eden, what Jesus intended for our world, for our societies, for our communities, for our neighborhoods, is that we would live in peace and harmony with God and with man. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching the good news of Jesus to fellowship to community to breaking bread and prayers praying for one another praying for their cities praying for the lost praying for those hurting praying for healing praying for rest and restoration praying for reconciliation like we see examples of prayers of them praying these things in scripture let me go back to that breaking of bread too that also meant they shared meals with one another. We actually see that later on. I, I, just, I just read it. They received food. They broke bread in their homes. They went to the temple. They gathered together corporately. But they also met in homes together. They were devoted to one another. They shared meals together. I'd encourage you, share meals with people. Share meals with people you don't know, with neighbors you don't know. Maybe even share meals with people who don't share the same socioeconomic status as you. Share meals with people who aren't your race. Share meals with people who aren't your gender. Like This is what Jesus did and his early followers did. And they broke bread in their homes and they had community and they loved one another and they had glad and generous hearts together. Man, how great would it be if our neighborhoods were filled with pockets of people doing this? Like, that's our heart here in Olathe. It's like, what if we could have this in our communities? People committed to one another, caring for one another, sharing meals with one another. Not, and it doesn't even matter what your race, gender, your age, what social demographic you're in. Like, it doesn't even matter. Like, how cool would that be? And that's what they are experiencing. And that what's, that's what God wants for his world, for our communities, for his kingdom. And I know it's hard to do that right now during... Um, COVID-19, like it's, it's, it's hard to do that. And so I'm not saying go do that. Like you gotta, you gotta have some wisdom, but I'd encourage you, you can take meals to people. You can call them, you can text them, you can chat with them. You can hang outside their driveway and talk to them. Like 
I'd encourage you, be in community. Devote yourselves to community. We see later on that the world began to be so much or so attracted to Jesus because of the way these people loved one another. Like they're going to know you're my disciples by your love for one another, Jesus says. And that's, and that's what was happening. Verse 43, it says, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Man, we see that miracles were happening to confirm the message of Jesus. And I'd encourage you, pray for healing. Not only for spiritual healing, or social healing, like pray for healing for neighbors and friends. You don't know, God might show up and heal someone in a miraculous way and you can be like, that was Jesus. Pray for healing. I mean, that's what was happening here and people were like, man, God loves us and he's bringing restoration into our communities. 45, it says, or 44, let me go back. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. You know, we talk about we're in this together. This early community of Jesus followers, they were in it together. Since they had all things in common, they were together. I looked up that word. I'm not a Greek scholar or anything like that, but I just looked up what that word meant in the original language. It actually means equality. It means equality. And what are we pushing for right now? Equality among races and genders and people all in our communities. So the church needs, 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 needs to be characterized by equality. Like no one is better than anyone else. It doesn't matter. Your race, your gender, anything, it doesn't matter. We're all created in the image of God. We all have value and worth. And that's what these people got and they knew it. They're like, man, we're together. We can, we're together. And they had all things in common. 45 says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. These people were so transformed by the grace and love of Jesus that they saw their brothers and their sisters on the left and the right, and they said, That's my brother and my sister. And I'm going to care for them. I mean, this is radical. Like how many of us, when we got our stimulus check, right? We're like, I'm going to give it away. Like, I'm sure that's what it happened. Like, man, I got extra money. This guy doesn't have a job right now. I want to give them some money. I'm going to give them some meals. But I mean, this was crazy. Like they were selling land and possessions. And you know why that was? It goes back to the good news of hope. It goes back to this because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, when we understand how much God gave to us, it frees us and it frees this community of Jesus followers to give radically and generously. Like that's my brother right there. He's got a need and I got this extra stuff or I might not have that much, but he needs it right now. You know, for, for Leah and I, God has just blessed us um, it's just, he's, he's just blessed us during this time, during this pandemic. Like Leah's had stable income with her job. I've been able to shoot a whole bunch of extra videos, which I didn't think I was going to be able to. And we were doing fine right before then. And then we get a stimulus check. And I know some people are, are not in our position right now, but we're just like, we were doing fine before this. Let's give a bunch of stuff away, Leah. Like God is just giving us, giving to us generously. And, and we have brothers and sisters in need all around us. So we're like, we're going we're gonna to buy a bunch of food. We're just going to give food away. We're going to put more money aside and give it to local churches and missionaries. We're going to give it to church planting. Hey, you know what? We had, we had, we had someone um, who we love. His car just was done. It was like, I don't. I don't have much money right now. And we're like, well, we got some extra money. It wasn't a lot, but like we gave it away. 
And that's what these people were doing. They saw their brothers and sisters in need and they're like, we're in this together. I'm in this with you. And I'd encourage you like, when you embrace the message of Jesus, you're gonna be compelled to do things like this. Live, love, and bless in extraordinary ways, friends. Live, love, and bless your neighbors, your community, your church family in extraordinary ways because you have been so blessed by a God who's, who gave his only son. And if God's willing to give his son, how will he not give you everything else you need for this life? That's what Romans says. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He knows what you need. He clothes the lilies of the field. He clothed Solomon, the richest man who probably ever lived. And he knows what you need. So he says, be generous. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or what you'll wear or what you'll put on. That's what people who don't believe in me do. But I care for you. I know what you need and I'll give it to you. Let's be radically generous like these people in this time because we're in this together and people need us. 46, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. The result of the way that this community of Jesus followers live, see, it's not like, we know it's not church. Like we talk about church, like the, the early church. Like we're the church. Our community, we are the church. It's not a building. We're not in buildings right now. We're still the church. But this community of believers, because they lived this way, it says here that day by day, God added to their numbers. People were compelled and moved. They're like, I want that hope that you have. I want to be a part of a community that's together. I want to be a part of a community that seeks to see racial justice and equality all across our city. I want to see a, 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 I want to be a part of a, a group of people that want to see social justice in our city, that want to see the orphans cared for, that want to see widows cared for. I want to see, I want to be a part of a community that radically gives to those who are in need. And people saw that and they were attracted to that and they're like, why are you doing that? Like because Jesus gave us everything we need. He came to give us forgiveness and he gave his life. And so we just want to give back and we're in this together. And friends, if we, if we embrace this message of hope, that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to free us from sin, death, and destruction and all things evil and wicked, when we embrace that, and we begin to live a life that reflects that, reminding ourselves, devoting ourselves to the gospel, to the good news, devoting ourselves to one another, to caring for one another, to praying with one another, to eating with one another. When we do that, God is gonna do something crazy in Olathe, in Overland Park, in Kansas City, or wherever else you're watching. And I'd encourage you, devote yourselves to community. Be in this together. We gotta be in this together. Look, I'll close with this. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. Not his buildings, we're not in buildings right now. He says, I'm gonna build this community, this family of Jesus followers and the gates of hell are not going to prevail. That's what Jesus said. And it looks like in our culture today, in our society today, that the gates of hell are prevailing. There's evil and wickedness running rampant. But Jesus made a promise. I'm going to build my community of Jesus followers who live lives like this, who live lives devoted to one another, devoted to eating together, to praying together, devoted to the good news of Jesus and spreading it and caring for one another and being generous with one another and standing up for social justice and standing up for equality and standing up for all things that are good, true, right, pure. He says, and I will push back the gates of hell. Like if we wanna see hope in our communities, 
We have to embrace this message and live lives like this that reflect the good news of Jesus, the message of hope. And when we do that, we're going to see communities transformed. We're going to see racism abolished. Man, I'd love to see that. But it's not going to happen until we start living like this. And when we start saying we're in this together, this is how God intended it. And it says here that he added to their numbers day by day. When we start living that way, people are going to be like, I want that. Hey, tell me about the hope that lies within you. I need that. I want that. And we're going to see our culture, we're see our communities changing. You know, when a preacher says he's going to close, he always has two closings. <laughs> but whenever you see the gospel of Jesus, or let, let's go back to Jesus. When you see Jesus walk into towns and villages in the gospels, like everywhere he went, you know what happened? The marginalized were cared for, they were given value. Women, prostitutes, Samaritans, sinners, thieves, murderers, Everywhere Jesus went, whole villages and towns were transformed. Women were liberated. Children were cared for. Racism was abolished. Like there was heated debate or there was heated racism between Jews and Samaritans. But when Jesus went in, he says, it's not about race. And he brought reconciliation between racial tension everywhere he went. And you know, when you look back down history of the church, everywhere the message of hope, the message of Jesus, the good news of the forgiveness of sins and new life went, women were liberated, children were cared for, reconciliation was brought between racial tension. Just go Google search. And so we need the message of hope to impact our lives in order that it might impact the lives of everyone around us. Friends, we're in this together. And the only thing that's gonna empower us to do that is embracing the message of hope. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for Jesus and the good news that he brought the greatest gift he could give himself to be the punishment for the wickedness and evil in our communities and our world and to be the punishment for the evil and wickedness in our own hearts. God, we thank you for Jesus and we pray that his love and his story of hope would compel us to live in our communities the way that Jesus intended us to live, pursuing justice and equality for all. I pray this in his powerful name, amen.